Please the Lord. Before I partake of the Lord's Supper today, let's return our Bibles again to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It is written once again in verse 24. And when he, the Lord Jesus Christ, had given thanks, he break it, that is the bread, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do at a remembrance of me. If the bread becomes the body of Jesus Christ, you don't have to remember Jesus Christ. That proves once again that the false doctrine, the heresy of transubstance initiation is false. It is a heresy. The bread that we eat does not become the body of Jesus Christ, nor the Protestant version that Jesus enters into the body and you're eating the, it entered the bread and now you're eating the bread of the body of Jesus Christ. Both the Catholic interpretation and the Protestant interpretation are false, are wrong, are not from the Word of God. The bread represents the body of Christ, and we do so in remembrance of Jesus Christ. It does not become his body. Recently, I saw a heretic practicing heresies, teaching heresies online in the Korean tribe, falsely calling himself an apostle who had the Lord's Supper at a house and wrote online that he was sharing the flesh and the blood of Jesus. This was a Baptist who is now a charismatic, who is a heretic and calls himself an apostle. The bread does not become the flesh of Jesus Christ. If it did, we would not have to remember Jesus Christ. The wine, the grape juice, does not become the blood of Jesus Christ. If we did, we wouldn't have to do so in remembrance of Jesus Christ, as it is written, verse 25, After the same manner also he, the Lord Jesus Christ, took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new test of my blood. This do you to drink it in remembrance of me. The bread we eat, the wine or the grape juice, wine means water from the vine, that we drink is not the flesh, is not the blood of Jesus Christ. It symbolizes his body. It symbolizes his blood. That's what we do in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Because how important the mind is. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. The mind is important when it comes to salvation. We have to also use our mind as well. At Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it is written, Come now and let us do what? Reason together. That means use your mind. Use your, the reasoning part of your mind, which comes from here the forefront. That is why this is one of the, if not the, hardest part of the body. That's why in most fighting combat sports, headbutts are illegal. Because headbutts in fights. There's still one combat sport today that allows headbutts. That is the Burmese boxing style known as Lithway. It is very dangerous. Not because they don't use gloves, because they allow headbutts. This is the hardest part, or one of the hardest parts of the body, because it protects your reasoning. That's why the Roman armor which the Apostle Paul uses as a description of the armor of God, they reinforce up here in the forefront to protect this part of the brain the most. It was reinforced because soldiers needed to use their reasoning. To win a battle, you got to use your mind. The mental is very important also when it comes to salvation. Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is if you reason, use your reasoning with the Lord. That's why we believe in preaching the gospel. That people can hear, think on it, use their reasoning, and receive it into their heart to be saved. The reasoning is very important when it comes to salvation. 
in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we see how we can be approved of God. And it's not by speaking in tongues run out. It's not by jumping up and down run out. How it can be approved of God is not by screaming songs and call that singing. Singing is not screaming. How could be approved of God? Verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study to show thyself to prove unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One of the most spiritual things you can do is study. Why? Because you got to use your reasoning. And the brain, though it's an organ, it's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. And when it comes to Christianity, studying is a very important part of Christianity. Is how we're approved of God. Not by speaking in tongues for a long time. Not by jumping down screaming for a long time. And not by saying hallelujah over and over again. We're approved unto God when we study the word of truth. Why is it that in Pentecostalism, the Holy Ghost and dancing got put together? And now people think of Pentecostals, they have Holy Ghost, they think of dancing. Where did this come from? Now in the New Testament, we don't read about dancing. Why not? Because Jesus Christ said the time will come, and it has come, when the worship of the Father shall worship in spirit and in truth. Dancing is flesh, it's not spirit. You cannot dance in the spirit. You can only dance in the flesh. In the Old Testament, they did not worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because Christ said the time will come. That time has now come in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they worship God according to their flesh. That's why David danced with all of his what? His might. That's flesh, his strength. That's not the spirit. Christ says we shall worship in the New Testament in spirit and in truth. So how come the Holy Ghost and dancing are put together in Pentecostalism? If you don't study, you don't know. Because in the Azusa Street Mission... A radical thing happened. African Americans and Caucasians began worshiping the Lord together for the first time in the United States of America. That's a beautiful thing. That was wonderful. At the same time, the African Americans introduced rhythm into the worship. These African Americans, of course, before they were born, before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, before they were spirit-filled, their worship, which came from Africa, had a lot of rhythm and drums involved and a lot of fleshly dancing, as well as the Native Americans, as well as here in heathen Thailand. We live above a place where we have a dragon dancing school, and we also have what they call lion dancing, and we also have a southern Lique school, and Thai is called Lique. It's the southern Thai soap operas, which is based on the drums. And if you want to know how noisy heathens can be, come spend an evening where we live, and you'll be blessed with all the noise the heathens make and all the drumming and all the rhythm. And so that got introduced to Pentecostalism on accident. So when people got the Holy Ghost began to worship the Lord with all the drum beats and the rhythm, dancing got associated with Pentecostalism. That was not a good thing. You got to separate it. What's of God and what's not? What's of the spirit and what's of the flesh? If you don't study, you can't separate it. That was in the move of the Holy Ghost of the dancing. The move of the Holy Ghost of the Azusa Street was the gifts of the spirit again. Was the focus on Christ's great commission again. But then the rhythm dancing came in as well. And it started spreading with Pentecostalism. Then the Pentecostal move of Azusa Street went up to where? Chicago. To a city called Zion, or they pronounce it in English, Zion City, founded by name of da by a man by the name of Dowie. It failed. It went bankrupt. This was supposed to be the healing center of the world because they put such a focus on a false doctrine called healing in the atonement. That Christ only died for your sins, he died for your healing. And they're going to make this city the healing center of the world. It failed. It went bankrupt. But then the Pentecostals of Azusa Street went up to Chicago, brought Pentecostalism, and then it mixed together with that healing teaching, which formed the full gospel. Then whenever the Pentecostal gospel went, so did the full gospel. If you don't study, you don't know these things. 
And now you see Pentecostals or full Gospels put more of an emphasis on healing than they do on salvation. And they put more of an emphasis on signs and wonders than they do on salvation. And they think the full gospel is healing. And instead of preaching salvation crusades, they preach healing crusades all over the world, focus on healing and not on souls getting saved. Why is that? Because of what happened there in Chicago at Zion or Zion City. If you don't study, you don't know these things. How important it is to study. How important it is to use the reasoning. How important it is to reason with the Lord. Now my earthly father, he likes martial art type movies. And when you associate with him, you have to watch those kind of movies with him. And they play a big part in his life. As with most martial artists, our focus on movies. Now, when I became a martial artist, I didn't focus on Hollywood martial arts. I got into prize fighting, ring fighting, and the prize fighting combat sport martial arts and the Hollywood martial arts are two different things. And I got focused on the fighting part. But my earthly father, he liked the martial art movies. And to spend time with them, father and son, you had to watch those movies together. And when he came back from Iraq in 2004, 2005, we went to visit him. He was doing security contract work, <clears throat> mercenary work in Iraq. And then his favorite movie in Iraq was this movie called The Last Samurai, where they made this Hollywood actor, Tom Cruise, who cannot fight his way of a paper bag, they made him into a samurai. And it was a, it's rather a humorous movie. If you're a real fighter, it can be funny to watch. But it was based on a true story, except that Tom Cruise wasn't in real life an American. He was a Frenchman. Because little people know today who don't study the French at one time were a mighty military power. Now the French are known for having sunburn under their arms. How do the French soldiers get sunburned under their arms? Doing this all the time. But before, they were once a mighty military power in the world. In fact, they influenced this world militarily. The world's largest cannon museum is in Bangkok, Thailand. It's in front of the defense ministry. And at one time, the cannons used to point on the front, which is facing the Royal Grand Palace. Well, they didn't like that, so they had to move every one of those cannons sideways. And there is hundreds to maybe even thousands of cannons. It's a lot. It's the world's largest cannon museum. There's a lot of cannons. They had to turn every one of them sideways. Not that long ago, the then President of the United States of America, Barack Hussein Obama, visited Bangkok, and he visited the Grand Palace. And the Secret Service of the United States of America had to stop up every one of those cannons. Because they're actually real cannons, and the Secret Service is so paranoid, they were scared somebody would take one of those cannons, turn around, and blow Obama up. So they had to stop every one of those cannons up so that nobody could use them by putting a little stopper inside of them. That's rather humorous. Well, one day we went there and, and visited the Cannon Museum and read the plaques of the different cannons who dedicated them to then Siam. And who was it mostly dedicated from? Almost all of them came from the French. Because at one time, the French was a mighty military power. And the French was the one that gave all these different cannons, most of them, if not all of them, to then Siam or Vietnam via the French again. And so most of them came from the French. They're once a mighty military power. What made the French weak was they started believing in their military might. And that's what sort of caused them to fall. Pride cometh before a fall. We're seeing that in different kinds of the world today that are full of pride and they're falling. When you have pride of your military power, you will fall. And the French fell real hard there and trying to recapture their colony of Vietnam in the north of Vietnam, where the Viet Minh under the general Vo Nguyen Zap, G-I-A-P, pronounced Zap, he did the impossible. He turned the mountains, which is what they use as a fortification, into a weapon by putting um, cannons, big cannons, artillery, 
on those mountains, taking them piece by piece, something the French thought the Vietnamese could not do under the leadership of Ziep. When the, the man in charge of the fence saw what the Vietnamese did, he took a gun and blew his brains out. He knew they had lost. And in Dinh Binh Phu, the French suffered one of the worst defeats by the Viet Minh, who later became the Vietnamese. The North Vietnamese, the communists, they defeated the French, this mighty military power, because they relied too much on their military might and underestimated a small group of people that had the will and the motivation to fight and to overcome. During the wars between Indochina, Vietnam versus France, Ziep and his French counterpart, the general, would meet together. That's what they do in battles. The generals will meet together. And Ziap broke down in front of the general and told about all the suffering he had been through under the French colony. How they had killed his first wife, tortured her to death in prison. How they killed many of his family members. And he broke down and cried about this. The general said, if I recall, we had to go on a death march once where I lost many of the good comrades. We had to march into starvation for many days and many of us died. And if I recall correctly, it was you who gave the order for the death march. Consider us even. Ziap dried his tears, and they continued to fight together. That's war. That's the way it is. That's how the war is. But the French, as we see, began falling because they relied on their military might. And in this movie called The Last Samurai, where instead of the French, which is what the true story is, they put an American in there, Tom Cruise playing this American part, and as he spent time with the samurai as a prisoner, they converted him to the way of the samurai, Bushido, which is bull crap -o. <laughs> could say another way, that was invented during World War II. That's not a real thing. That was invented before World War II to get the Japanese moral hype. But they put this Bush Bushido in there and had Tom Cruise converting to Bushido, the way of the warrior, and had changed. And in the movie, the corrupt Japanese prime minister noticed that the Tom Cruise character is something to deal with when what? When he offered him some alcohol and he refused it. And in the movie, it showed the evil man playing the Japanese prime minister have a shocked look on his face. Uh-oh, he's no longer drinking alcohol. He is sober-minded. That's the way it is in this world, especially amongst the devil. If you are sober-minded, and you are studying, and you are using your mind with the spirit, with the soul, with the body, but with the mind as well, you are a force to reckon with. Because if you study and show yourself approved unto God, you are approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be put to shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're that man of God or that woman of God who studies, who uses the mind, you are a threat to the devil. That's why in the epistles of Peter, as he warns about the last days, he commands us in this special ghost to be sober. You've got to be sober-minded. It's important to also use the mind. As we take of the Lord's Supper, it's not just a physical thing we're doing and not just a spiritual thing we're doing. It is a mental thing, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering what he has done for us, remembering how he died and shed his blood for us, that though our sins be ascarted, they should be what? White as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be what? White as wool. When you get this in your mind, when you get a realization of your sins are blotted out, they were once scarlet, now they're white as snow. That they were once crimson, but now they're as wool. When you're that white in God's sight because of the blood of Jesus, you're a force to be reckoned with. You are somebody the devil can't take on because the devil tries to put doubt, seeds of doubt in people's minds, fiery darts of the wicked one, fiery darts of the devil. He shoots those fiery darts into your mind to place doubt that when you're praying for the sick, we're going to cast a devil somebody. These thoughts come in. The devil just, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you're not called to do this. Oh, you don't have the power to do this. You don't have faith to do this. You did this. You did that. You're not worthy of this. It takes the mind to put those thoughts down, take them captive, and get rid of those thoughts and think on the truth of God's word. 
that though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you get this in your mind, if you get to the realization of who you are in Christ Jesus, and how God sees you through Christ Jesus, and what the blood of Jesus Christ has done in your life, when you get this realization in, when you get this in your mind, you're a force to be reckoned with on this earth. The devil will fear you. The devil will flee from you. You'll have such power and be such a witness in the Christ that nothing, no one can stop you. But it takes the mind. As we take of the Lord's Supper, let us remember Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus and what he has done for us and of who we are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord.